Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Naaman healed of leprosy. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him to, to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hands over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went, went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped, dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. My Lord, what a morning. Amen. It is good to be back. High Park Union Church, good to have Sarah back, amen. Our message today is both from 2 Kings 5 with Miss Christina Edwards read for us, thank you. And also I'd like to read a verse from Luke 4, verse 27 through 30. And it reads, and this is Jesus speaking, and there were many in Israel with leprosy, in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw Jesus off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Amen. 
Let us pray. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The title of this message is The Healing That Almost Wasn't. A common theological question for Christians is this, does God intervene in human affairs? Is there any such thing as divine intervention? Does God make happen what God wants to make happen when and how God chooses to make it happen? Those are questions that are often explored, pondered, if you will, in theological circles as we try to figure out God and the ways of God. But those questions have led me to the opposite question, one that is also worth pondering, and that is, can humans intervene in God's affairs? Do we as humans have the ability to alter the outcome of what God is trying to accomplish? And even if we don't think humans can do this in the long run, for instance, if we believe that the arc of the whole universe is long, but it ultimately bends towards justice, can humans in the short term intervene and temporarily disrupt the plan of God for ourselves and for others? Congruent with these ponderings are some of my other questions, such as whether things of faith appropriately account for the human will, the human ego, human emotions, human psychology. After all, we are human, all human, and we enter relationships with one another and join organizations, including the church, and we bring our full selves with us. As the psalmist of Psalm 139 says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are complex beings, mind, body, and spirit. We are not just physical beings, but we are neurological and psychological beings. And when we function, every part of our being is involved. And if it is true that God works through us and that we can potentially influence the outcome of God's affairs, then one might deduce that it is important to be aware and to understand ourselves our idiosyncrasies, our moods, all that makes us tick, all that makes us who we are as we seek to build God's kingdom, as we seek to love our neighbor as ourselves, so that we can be the best we can be for God and for what God seeks to do through us and in us. Today's scripture brings human relationships and interactions to the center stage to be examined for lessons of what can happen. What, when human interaction and all of its drama encounters God's will. Let's dissect the text and the humans in the text to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. Naaman, the main character of the scripture, is a powerful man. He's a commander in the army, and not just any army, but the army of a kingdom that just defeated Israel in battle. The text says that Naaman, verse 1 says, the man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. And so the first human lesson is that even the powerful have problems. It's quiet. It's okay, I'm gonna keep going. And that's our first lesson. If we're human, no matter how powerful we are, we are subject to human frailty, disease, illness. This mighty man had a problem. The problems do not discriminate. Do with that as you will. Only God knows how that's speaking to you today. Just know that those giants in your life, those people who seem to have so much power, just know that not only do they have power, they also have problems. The text tells us that this powerful man, Naaman, was sick with leprosy. But the text also tells us that the one whom this powerful man held in captivity had compassion. I'm in verse 2. Be good if you follow. Verse 2 says, now the Arameans 
on one of their raids had taken this young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. The text seems to juxtapose this powerful man who had a problem with this young slave girl held in captivity who had care and concern for her master. She's aware that Naaman is sick and she suggests that he sees the prophet in Samaria who can cure him of his leprosy. So the second human lesson of the text is that humans, even those who are mistreated in this world, can have compassion towards their captors. It's a reality that the mistreated don't always return evil for evil, but often return good for evil. This is an interesting lesson about human relationships possibly to be unpacked another day and realize that it's in the text. The story continues. The slave girl suggests that her sick master name and see the prophet in Israel, for the prophet can heal him of his disease. Naaman listens to her, takes her suggestion, and asks his king, someone's in authority over him, to send him to Israel to be healed. So the king of Aram tells Naaman to go and that he'll send a letter to the king of Israel on his behalf. Next enters the next player in this scene, the king of Israel. Now understand that even though he's the king of Israel, he's a king who was just recently defeated in a war by the king of El. And now he receives a letter from this same king who just defeated him. And the letter simply reads, when this letter reaches you, Know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of leprosy. The text says in verse 7 that when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life? That this man sends word to me to, to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he's trying to pick a fight with me. So far we've learned that powerful can have problems, that captives can have compassion, and now we learn that the defeated can suffer from trauma. I'm not making light of trauma. Trauma is real, and so is post-traumatic stress, and it's in the text. War has taken place in the scripture and in our lifetime. People have been injured. In the text and in our lifetime, and in the text, the king of Israel reads a simple letter, but it's from his enemy. And I surmise that because of his trauma from the war at the hands of this king, he completely misunderstands the message, assumes evil intentions, and almost blocks Naaman's healing because he has trauma from the war that he just lost. And trauma is real because harm to humans is real. And if it showed up in scripture, it can show up in any of us who have been through anything traumatic in our lifetime. The king of Israel suffering from trauma is defeated and defensive, misunderstands the letter, and concludes that the king of Aram has evil intentions and he has no intentions of facilitating the healing of man. But the prophet Elijah hears what happened, the text says, and sends a message to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? In other words, why did you get so angry because of that letter? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. The prophet Elijah heard what happened. The next lesson in the text about humans is that humans talk. Amen? People spread the news of what's happening in the kingdom and in the community. But thank God they talked because the prophet, the one who hears and acts on God's behalf, intervened and said, let me help. So we've had several human lessons. Now for a God lesson, God has people positioned to help resolve a matter. 
People who will not get caught up in the drama. People who can help resolve an issue. People who care enough to be an agent of reconciliation. People who are in a community for such a time as this who can bring healing to a broken situation. So the story continues. Naaman is aware of the prophet's invitation and goes to the prophet Elijah's house. And when he arrives, Elijah sends Naaman a message and tells him how to receive his healing. Verse 10 reads, Elijah sent a message to him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. And, and I guess in some version, the story could have ended right there. Elisha could have done what the instruction said and been healed, but no, that wasn't the end of it. Verse 11 says, Naaman, excuse me, Naaman became angry and went away saying, went away, went away from the possible healing that he could have had. He went away saying, I thought for me, he would surely come out. And stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot. That's what the text says. <laughs> Do something miraculous for me. I'm me. And cure my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? How dare he tell me to go wash in Israel's waters? Why didn't he? and do something miraculous. Tell me to wash in my own waters. Could I not wash in them and be clean? And he turned away from his healing and went away in rage. Here we clearly see a lesson on the human condition that not only does this powerful man have a health problem, he also suffers from pride and privilege. Did you hear his language? The scripture says, he said, for me, surely he'd come out. For me, surely he'd do something miraculous. For, for me, surely he would have me wash in places that I'd rather wash, like the rivers of Damascus. Naaman is about to block his own healing. That's how damaging pride and privilege can be. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And Naaman would rather walk away and not be healed because he couldn't, couldn't get it the way he wanted it. The text is trying to teach us that pride and ego and privilege are dangerous even for one's own well-being. We all need to ask ourselves, is pride and privilege my problem? Am I stuck in a problem because of my pride? Because of pride and privilege, Naaman's healing is a healing that almost wasn't. But God, God used Naaman's servants who approached Naaman and spoke truth to power. And verse 13 says, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more? When all he said to you was wash and be clean. Sometimes the solution is simple. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy and he was clean. Naaman followed the instructions of the prophet by the encouragement of his servants. Finally receiving his healing, but it's the healing that almost wasn't. Because of pride and ego, it's the healing that almost wasn't. Because of anger and trauma, it's the healing that almost wasn't. Because of misunderstandings, it's the healing that almost wasn't. Because of human condition that makes human interaction sometimes difficult, sometimes challenging, and even self-defeating. But God shows up through people who have compassion, and God shows up through people who don't get caught up in the drama. And God shows up through people who can make sense out of nonsense. And when God shows up, compassion shows up. When God shows up, reconciliation shows up. When God shows up, healing shows up. And the story goes down in history as an important healing because a Gentile Naaman 
received a healing from the prophet Elijah, who is the prophet of Israel's God. The God, excuse me, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The story goes down in history because grace was shown to a Gentile, considered an outsider, despised, despite, excuse me, his own issues. The story goes down in history because God blessed the other. For the other is also God's own. The story goes down in history, even in New Testament history, because Jesus tells the story of Naaman in Luke 4, 27. When he says that there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Naaman's healing was key because it defied privilege, it defied defied chosenness, it defied legacy, it defied self-defeat, and it taught a lesson of human interaction and a lesson of divine providence and a lesson of God's intervention amidst human frailty. What shall we take from this story in addition to what we've already taken? What's important enough for Jesus to preach from 2 Kings 5? So glad you asked. The first lesson we take is that the church is the people. Amen? It's not this building. It's the people in the building. And people are not perfect. Every human emotion and condition in this ancient story we find in our contemporary stories. People with problems, anger and compassion, pride and humility, privilege and underprivilege, trauma and healing. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, the Apostle Paul says it this way, but we have this treasure in God, jars of clay, humans, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are jars of clay, we are human, we impact the spaces we enter, the relationships we are in, and so we should be mindful of ourselves. We should ask ourselves every once in a while, how am I doing? How is my soul today? How is my spirit? Am I suffering from trauma? Am I causing confusion or harm to myself? Blocking my hearing? Am I causing confusion in my relationships? Recognize your state of being. In other words, be aware of your emotional well-being and how that impacts your human interactions. The Bible is a source of encouragement. This is why we should read our Bible, we should study our Bible. It is a source of encouragement and guidance with human emotion. It teaches us and helps us to learn to live in harmony with ourselves and with others. If it's anger, Paul said in Ephesians 4, 26, in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. If it's pride, you've already heard from Proverbs 16, 18. But now here from 1 Peter 5, 5, which says, clothe yourselves in humility. If it's impatience, Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. If we do not give up, if it's fear and depression, Isaiah 41 and 10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, depressed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And of course, the Bible addresses human emotions, for we are God's people, God's creation, God's handiwork. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and God desires to use us for God's glory. But let me just stick a pen right here and say, and I live by this, it's okay to have Jesus and a therapist. Amen. It's okay to have Jesus and scripture that speaks to your issues and a therapist. What else should we take from this story? Allow God to use you as a peacemaker. Naaman almost wasn't healed because he encountered, but, uh, but he encountered, excuse me, on two occasions, people who cared and whose 
spoke up, he encountered people, unlikely people, who were not shaken by personalities, position, power, prestige, but only wanted to do good. Only wanted to help him receive his healing. And I believe when Naaman encountered those people, Naaman encountered God, who didn't give up on him. He encountered God who was full of mercy and grace. God with the divine intervention ensured that Naaman was healed, thereby creating an example for the Savior to share. An example of this powerful man who was healed despite the odds being against him. Healed despite a traumatized king. Healed despite his own pride, courage, and ego. Healed by God's grace that showed up in an unexpected ways through a child through a prophet, and through a servant. The writers of Lamentation makes my final point when he says, it is because of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Because of God's compassion, they never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We serve a God who is full of mercy, and full of grace and who is faithful. May God's grace and faithfulness show up in your lives and in our lives together in unexpected ways. May God's healing show up in your lives, each and every one of you, and in our life together. May God's love show up in our lives, individually and collectively, in this community of believers, in this community of Chicago, and may God use us as a divine example of what God's grace and mercy and healing look like in these contemporary times. And may all the glory go to God. Amen.